Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Fab Braska, who's CEO and founder at Tri Success Advisory. And today we're going to talk about what supply chain execs can learn from an Ironman triathlete. Yes, Fab is an Ironman triathlete. And Fab is also one of the most knowledgeable and experienced uh, technology executives in the supply chain logistics realm, uh, especially when it comes to transportation management. Um, I first met Matt Fab, you know, more than 25 years ago when I started my career as an industry analyst. And I think at the time he was working at I2 Technologies, which was then, you know, acquired by JD8 Software and then eventually became, you know, Blue Yonder. Um, and now almost after 30 years in the technology uh, field, Fab reached, recently launched uh, Tri-Success Advisory, which among other things, provides fractional uh, executive leadership and career life uh, balance coaching. So how has FAB been able to succeed both as a business executive and an Ironman triathlete, which both um, you know, demand a lot of time, energy, and, and commitment? And what lessons has he learned that would benefit other supply chain and logistics professionals? Well, those are the key questions we're going to kind of dive into in today's episode. And it's great to have FAB on the program to share his insights and advice. So FAB, welcome to the program. Adrian, thanks for having me and thanks for the kind words. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and and uh, and just share my experience. Hopefully it adds value to everyone out there. Yeah, I think when we first met, I had a full head of hair and you had jet black hair. So <laughs> you, 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 yeah, I think a, a, a time has passed a, a long time. And and certainly a lot has changed in the technology realm since we both you know got into this industry. So before we kind of dive into kind of the Ironman stuff, which I'm, of course, as a as an athlete myself, I'm, I'm always fascinated by. Um, I'm, I, I want to get your perspective on, you know, the current state of supply chain logistics, uh, software market. I mean, what do you see as the, the biggest trends and the challenges in the industry today, both as a vendor and as a, as, from a shipper perspective? Yeah, there, there, there's a lot to comment on there, but let me, let me kind of narrow it down to a handful of things that I, I think are really pertinent in today's market. Um, one with a lot of the economic pressures, uh, that, you know, shippers or, you know, as technologists or potential customers are under, um, there is a lot more scrutiny on what adds value to, to their ecosystem. You know, as you and I know, lots of companies come and go, there's hype cycles, people get excited by a technology or a trend or a fad, and, and um, some stay, uh, some don't. And uh, I think we're in a phase now where organizations are being much more diligent on value and time to value. Um, so they're less, you know, um, tolerant about kind of taking a flyer on new technology. They want to understand stuff, that stuff works, and that's actually going to impact their business. And, you know, the consequence of that is, you know, in a world where there's always, especially technology, there's constantly startups. Um, there's much more focus on a lot of those startups to really manage their growth um, with fiscal responsibility. As you know, sometimes we have these hype cycles where, you know, investors just pour money in and everyone just, you know, goes crazy and tries to grow fast without, without eye to profitability. Um, but that's certainly changed. And so companies are, are really forced to be fiscally responsible. And then, you know, kind of the third thing I'll comment on is you're seeing and, and, and are going to continue to see some interesting consolidation. Um, as companies look to expand their portfolio, uh, maybe some standalone solutions, uh, you know, providers are looking to, to go down the, the sweet play, uh, maybe other organizations that, you know, existed as independent entities, you know, do find themselves for sale. Uh, you know, one, I think that's going to be interesting to watch, um, you and I have talked about before is this, you know, blue yonder acquisition of one network. I think that's going to be, you know, an interesting combination. As you know, I, obviously I have history there, so I, they're always near and dear to my heart. Um, so I think you're going to see more of that type of consolidation in the market. And uh, as always, it's, it's always a fun space to be in because there's just constant change. Yeah, that's what I always tell folks. I mean, I think that, you know, a, a lot of folks get into this industry from other roles, right? So my background is in engineering, you know, and I started my career in semiconductor manufacturing, right? So but I think a lot of folks, when they land in supply chain, they tend not to leave just because it is 
Right. Um, you know, so exciting. It's always changing. There's a lot of innovation taking place. And certainly you see that in, in the technology realm. And I agree hundred percent. I mean, when I talk to a lot of shippers, I mean, going back again, going back to, you know, the late nineties, early two thousands, you know, um, and you saw a lot of these implementations that would take, you know, a year, two years, three years, and, and the ROI or the payback was, you know, again, very long, uh, right. uh ramp up there. Um, I think the appetite, like you said, the appetite for those among shippers is uh, basically zero today. You know, uh, I mean, certainly they want to have a long-term roadmap and 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 strategy, but you know, as they invest in technology, they want to make sure that um, number one, there is a clearly defined um, objective that's aligned with a current problem that they have, and that they're going to start seeing some payback, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, yeah. So, so I think certainly, I think that is the the key thing there. I think the interesting thing now is you know, with, you know, there's so much talk about hype cycle. There's so much discussion today about AI, right? Sure. And, and, and there's still a lot of confusion about it. It's moving so quickly. Uh, I think a lot of companies and executives know in their gut that this is something that they need to be doing something in. But I think a lot of them, to your point, are still saying, well, where, where's the right place to start, right? And they're looking to their technology partners um to say to, to help guide them right in terms Absolutely. of you know demonstrate how this is actually going to benefit this tms or this wms or this visibility solution and actually going to you know deliver value versus it just being a um uh you know something that's you know pie in the sky or, or something that's right. you know less defined um so yeah i mean it's certainly a lot to to look forward to uh in in the industry in the years to come um so anyway, let's let's transition now to the 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 Iron Man uh, uh, piece of it. You know, I think as many of our viewers know, I mean, I do century bike rides, which which are hundred miles, and, and it's not easy, you know, to cycle a hundred miles and and to train for it. I mean, usually, you know, it, it takes hours on the bike, and you know, we training for weeks and weeks, you know, to to get up and build the endurance and and so forth. But an Iron Man um, triathlete. You know, you you don't cycle just over a hundred miles. You also swim two miles beforehand, and then after getting off the bike, you run a marathon. You know, after that, which to me is just you know a whole level, other level of of insanity in some ways, and and obviously a physical effort and and time commitment too. So, um, I guess my main question is, I've always wanted to ask this of a triath uh, Ironman triathlete is, you know, number one, how did you get involved? Yeah. with doing triathlons and why Ironman? Yeah, so um, I guess a couple of things to start and, you know, to set the table for the audience. One is, um, you know, because there's lots of, uh, you know, people we know that are just natural athletes and they've always done athletic things. Um, I was not, I was a very unathletic kid. So, you know, the, the fact that I'm in this world is, is definitely, a, you know, a very uh, dramatic change and transformation. Uh, I did become athletic, you know, in, in my late teens and, and early twenties. Um, but really what sparked us or started the journey, you know, like a lot of us, when we're starting families, uh, you know, I was in my thirties, I, I, I got very unhealthy, um, you know, to one point where I, I had to lose about 30 pounds, which, you know, as you know, I, I'm not a big guy. I don't, I don't have a big frame. That's, that's actually a lot of, of weight. And, um, I started getting back into, into running and, in in my, in, you know, in, in my twenties, I, I did dabble in this notion of multi-sport. I did what, what are called duathlons, run, bike, run. And I started to get back into that world and, and started to get a circle of, of friends. And quite honestly, one thing led to another and I got convinced and, and I've always had a mentality of, of wanting to do things, you know, beyond what I thought I was capable of. But the big thing was I couldn't swim. And uh, funny enough, I was just, I was just tired of explaining to people what a duathlon was. Most people at least know what a triathlon is. And so I embarked, that's really the start was I embarked on that particular journey was, was learning how to swim. And, you know, I've talked about look, swimming in a pool and swimming in open water are two different things. You know, there's a lot of fear and anxiety I had to conquer. Uh, I did fail, um, which is, you know, as, as, those of us that are, are pretty uh, success oriented and, and had, have had successful careers is, is tough to swallow, but it's something you learn from. And I kept at it and managed to do my first triathlon. And, and from then it just, it just, it escalated. 
Uh, and when you get in that circle, people are always encouraging you to do that next event and that next biggest thing. And I literally went from my first sprint triathlon, which are very, you know, much shorter distances, uh, to doing my first half Ironman the, the following year, and which was a big jump. And it became a thing I started to do. And then eventually, I knew I wanted to do a full at some point, you know, as, as you know, especially my career when I was at Blue Yonder, I was flying around a lot. Um, I said I wouldn't until, you know, I had a, a point in my career where I could manage that. But I had some wisdom um, from a friend of mine that said, look, if you really want to do something, you'll find the time. Because the reality is we do all waste a lot of time during our days. And, um, and so I made the leap and I signed up and, and, and it, it went from there. And, uh, but it was really about just chasing something that was beyond what I thought. And, uh, and it's become now, a, a you know, a, just doing those types of things become a passion for me. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, I, I also can't swim. I mean, I, I, I can swim, but I can't swim in th to the extent of, uh, you know, I can swim in a pool. I can swim from here to there, right type of thing. But, you know, you're right. I mean, swimming in, uh, you know, a, a triathlon, particularly if you're swimming in, in the ocean or you're swimming in a lake, is completely different, particularly when you have, you know, uh, tens of not hundreds of people all around you kicking in your face and, and all that. Yes. It's very, um, very anxiety uh, prone. And I know um, my wife and three of my kids have done sprint triathlons. Uh, and actually my oldest son has done uh, an Olympic uh, triathlon as well, as well as with my wife. And th there's one that we always used to do as a family um, here in Cohasset, Massachusetts, which is always at the end of June. But the water temperature is still very cold at the end of June. And so yeah, you have to wear a wetsuit. And I remember yeah. the last time my wife um, uh, did it, uh, you jump in that water and you get that cold feeling. Um, and you notice yeah, they have, they usually have kayaks, people on kayaks to rescue Always, folks. Yes. Because a lot of folks, you know, either from just the, 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 the temperature change or just that anxiety of you just can get quickly disoriented and you need to get uh, rescued. So it's not... It's not uncommon to quote unquote fail because it is, uh, you know, so that's, that's how my, I've always, you know, my kids always say, cause I used to run in high school and in college. And, and then of course my knees uh, didn't like it as much. So that's how I got into more into cycling. And I did do athlons as well. Yeah. Uh, but psych swimming has always been the, uh, the weakest link. And I'm like, well, well, when we first talked, you kind of inspired me. I'm like, well, maybe now, maybe later in life I can, you know, try, try to do that. And I think the other thing I think that's, that's key that I've learned as well is that you know, if you put something on the calendar, right, if you actually sign up for it, right. now you've made a commitment, you know, not only have you put money down, if you will, yes. um, that yeah, you're at risk of losing if you don't, uh, if, if you don't follow through, but now you've got a date on the calendar, you've got something very tangible and specific to go towards. And that that serves as a, as a motivation as well. So I guess the next obvious question is, I mean, what lessons have you learned as a triathlete that have helped you and, and can help others in, in, in your business career? Yeah. Um, and, and I'll start with the, the one I, I mentioned, which is a, is a critical one, which is all about time management and the definition of priorities. And, um, the, and I'll start with the latter because it's an interesting one. Uh, one of, uh, you know, mutual friend of ours, you know, Razak Garab, a good friend of mine and, and has been a great mentor. He gave me some great wisdom years ago. You know, we talked about uh, you know, managing life balance. And, and he made the comment, uh, much like we learn in supply chain with the theory of constraints, is you, you can only balance so many things. And so if you really want to achieve great things, you have to narrow down, excuse me, your priorities to those two or three things that are most critical to you. And you pay those first, much like your savings account, right? You pay that first and then you go spend and, and I went through that exercise and, and that was really helpful. And, and, you know, it takes some effort um, to really decide what key things are going to be at the top of your queue. Like many people, I like to do a lot of things. You know, I, I, you know, I'm a drummer as a hobby. I like to read. I, there's lots of things I like to do, but I can't get to them all. And, and going through the exercise of deciding what that priority was going to be and then allocating my time accordingly and not being stressed out if I don't get to everything else, that was a big milestone. And, and work is, is just like that. But that deliberate, that deliberate decision is, is really important because a lot of 
um, you know, colleagues, executives that I've engaged with, and, and, you know, I do a lot of mentorship. That's a common question because they automatically, you know, the response is, oh, I don't have time. And, you know, I'll get to it later. And I'm so busy. And, and so making the decision on, first of all, are you doing too much, too many things? And then how are you really allocating your time? And that's the other avenue to it is if we analyze, truly analyze our calendars, we waste a lot of time. And, um, and of course, there's a discipline side to that when you're taking on something like this. I mean, there were cases where, you know, I'd be traveling and, and you know, I'd have to get up at, at four in the morning, uh, you know, to get a run in or, or you know, time on the bike. Um, but that goes, that's tied to the prioritization, but finding that time it, it's there. You just got to decide that, you know, whether you want to do it or not. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree a hundred percent. And I think that's something that I've, I've learned more and, you know, more recently. I mean, one of the things that, and I, and I wrote about this, you know, with my, you know, my recent, you know, health challenges and, and, and so forth. And, you know, one of the things that I've, I've, that's helped me you know, on this journey that I've been on, um, is, is exactly that, right? It's really taking a step back from a kind of a mental health perspective is really taking a step back and say, okay, what, what are the, what's really truly important to me, both in yeah. life and in, um, and from a, from a work standpoint and, and then really saying, you know, um, and then really analyzing the behaviors uh, on a daily basis, right? Is this thing that I'm engaging in that I'm spending my time on is this aligned with my values and my objectives or is this really truly a distraction, something that's taking me away, you know, from that? Yeah. Right. So am I spending too much time on, you know, did I just waste an hour on LinkedIn or on Twitter when I should have been doing this? Right. Uh, did I just, uh, uh, you know, and, and that goes in, in, you know, in life as well. So I think, you know, really clearly defining your goals and objectives, what you're and prioritizing those and then understanding that you can't do it all. And then really uh, looking at uh, how you're spending, how you're actually spending your time. Right. Um, I think, you know, goes a long way to truly achieving those things if, that are important to you. If, if I can add something, you know, another, uh, another executive I interacted with uh, that I have to give full credit to, uh, you know, the former CEO of, of Blue Yonder, Girish Rishi, who's now the CEO of a, a company called Cognite. You know, I, I had a breakfast with him once and he showed me his calendar. And it really speaks to the point of time management is also about taking ownership of your calendar. And especially, you know, if you're coming up from, you know, the ground up into an organization, you always want to say yes to everything and you want to accept every invite. And if you really want to achieve great things, you have to be much more disciplined and really own that calendar. And that was one thing he shared with me. I mean, he showed me his calendar and literally he had swaths of time chunked out a lot to focus on, you know, whether it's strategic thinking or, or you know, a analytics, he took hold of it. Um, and he basically said, look, if I took every invite, I would get nothing done. And that was a big lesson. And, and that, you know, that was uh, definitely something that that helped in managing my time and managing my priorities. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great example there. I mean, well, I, I've done something sort of to that, and, but I've done it on a, on a smaller scale, which is really just email time. Because what I found for me was that I would spend a lot of time on email, right? Just responding to emails, reading emails, thinking about how I'm going to respond to an email, so on and so forth. And so what I've decided to do was every morning now, the first thing I do is not check email. The first right. thing I do is what's 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 the top priority that I want to accomplish today, whether it's finish writing my blog post or preparing for an interview like this or working on a research report. Um, and I, I would spend two hours, a solid two hours, we all taking little breaks in between, you know, go get a snack, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, read something, you read the newspaper, whatever for five or 10 minutes to take break, mental break, but really two hours of quote unquote productive time. And then I check email and I, I yeah. only block a half hour for email and then right. I, I check it again at lunch and then I check it again at the end of the day. So I don't have it open all the time because we all know what happens, at least to me is. I'm Absolutely. working on something, an email comes in, it's like, oh, it's fab. And I immediately go to that and say, oh, let me just get right back to him, you know? And um, and again, next thing I know, I've, I've, I've killed 15 minutes or 20 minutes, right. you know? And now it it's taking me away from, you know, this more productive thing that I should have been working on all along. Um, and I think that goes a long way towards, again, minimizing the, you know, stress that a lot of uh, executives feel, which leads me to my next question. I mean, we recently did 
you know, we asked our members, uh, members of our Indago research uh, community who are all supply chain logistics executives from manufacturing, retail and distribution companies. You know, we asked them how stressful is working in supply chain management. And almost two thirds of the member respondents, 65% said that working in supply chain management and logistics was either stressful or very stressful. So I, number one, I, does this surprise you? And how does stress management tie into your Ironman experience? Yeah, so it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, and, you know, I, I think especially with in the supply chain sector, with all the things that organizations have to deal with now, you know, we, we uh, you know, myself and some of the, you know, my fellow thought leaders of the industry, we talk a lot about how, you know, we used to talk about black swan events and now it feels like black swan events are the norm right you, you know instead of happening just once in a while and, and being dramatic you know traumatic uh now it seems to be this constant um stream of of major things that are happening and of course you know supply chain practitioners have to deal with that and it's constant firefighting so totally understand that you add to that the stresses that you know what we went through with covid and and you know these dramatic shifts and these dramatic changes um it, it feels like mental health is a, is I'm, and I'm glad it's a bigger priority and on every everyone's mind. Um, you, you know, I think for me personally, you know, having these this outlet, um, it, it's it's been a reminder and a blessing that you do need to have things outside of work, uh, family, friends, your activities that help uh, relieve that stress. It can't all be 100 percent about work. Um, it, so having that balance that goes back to my my notion around priorities and making explicit decisions that you have to have time for you and and what you know you define as time for you could mean a lot of things could just be you know it could be uh doesn't have to be you you know solitarily it could be you hanging out with your kids or your spouse or whatever whatever brings you satisfaction joy but there has to be something else um the other thing I'll add that's, you know, been really a benefit for me coming specifically from this world um, and particularly, you know, driving to the level of, of an Ironman is, uh, and I don't know what other word to use, but it's, it's helped me develop this level of grit, um, of mental endurance. And, you know, for those out there, one of the things that's unique about this type of competition or this type of event, unlike let's say running, um, you know, you can't wear things like headphones. It's like, you don't have the ability to distract yourself uh, with, you know, movies, music, whatever, you know, you, you, you want. And um, so you're forced to, you really need to train without those things and you get into that habit. And it's, it's, uh, and I, I think I showed, uh, shared with you, I, I, one of the things I incorporated in my training is I started swimming in my pool tied to a, a tether, tied to a rope. And uh, if, if you thought a treadmill was boring, uh, swimming is stationary in a pool to build your strength is, is, is 10 times more so. But it's given me this mental, you know, um, fortitude. And you learn to, um, play little games around really focusing on smaller milestones. And this is another lesson, by the way, to your previous question around supply chain as well, is, uh, and even when you're in an Ironman event, you never really think about the, the scope of the whole distance. You're always thinking about the next milestone, swimming to the next, you know, swim boy or, you know, cycling to the next aid station. And, um, and breaking things down into those increments really helps you with that mental fortitude. Because you're not thinking about the big, the biggest, bigger picture. You have certainly an eye on that goal, but breaking it down into these little increments and little wins allows you to basically endure anything. And um, you know, so that's something I, that I feel like, you know, having gone through that experience is really built in me, and and I value that immensely. It literally, you know, translates to all aspects of my life. Yeah, that's right. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of folks always ask me, hey, "Gosh, how can you cycle a hundred miles?" And you know, my 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 canned response as well. Well, you know, one mile at a time, you know? Right. Um, I mean, that's, that's the, that's basically it. Cause when you, you know, if you sit back and you think about a hundred miles, I mean, that's a long distance. Sometimes I actually like in my car when I'm driving, I'll say, 
let's see how far I've gone. Gosh, I've gone 95 miles. Gosh, and I think back to how far we've already, yeah. how far we are from home already. And I go, God, I'd cycle this distance, you know? And it's mind boggling to think, but at the time, you're right. I mean, I tend to think about it as, okay, the next rest stop is in 15 miles. And when I get to the 15 mile mark, instead yeah. of thinking about, gosh, I've got another 85 miles to go. I'm like, yes, I've, I've accomplished 15 miles already. And now the next rest stop is in 20 miles. And that's what I'm going to focus on is to get to that next 20 mile, uh, finish, get that 20 miles done. And then you say, gosh, I've already done 35 miles, right? right. So you're focusing on what you, you're accomplishing so far versus keep thinking about, oh gosh, I still have all this left. And, and that, you know, that just that change in perspective in terms of look small, you know, breaking it up into small increments, celebrating those small successes versus thinking yeah. about how much more you have to go, um, I think is, uh, um, uh, you know, certainly helps, you know, helps a lot. Um, so Fab, I mean, we could, we could probably keep talking about all this, uh, you know, all, all day, because I'm, I'm just fascinated by, by this topic, but maybe as a way to wrap up, I mean, for anyone watching who might want to get started as a, as a triathlete or may want to start something new at their company or in their career that seems like almost impossible right now. I mean, what's the first step? I mean, what advice would you give to them? Um, you know, one of the first things I, I would say, and it ties back to something I said at the beginning is don't limit yourself. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the, the kind of the life lessons, you know, that I've embraced through, you know, entire span of what seems to be now a longer life as we've talked about getting a little older but you know if I only did things that I thought I could do you know I'd be so much more limited and you know the the idea of of reaching out and and having audacious goals and wanting to do something bigger uh, and I think back even to when I got into this technology space you know the little startup that took a chance on me um you know, small fledgling TMS uh, based up here in, in Canada. Uh, I had never sold software before. I knew nothing about transportation. And I went and interviewed anyway and, and, and managed to secure my role. And so taking those leaps, I think, is, is really uh, an important aspect to any of this. Set big goals. Uh, and if you fail on the long way, that's okay. As long as you're learning and developing and growing. But take those steps and make them audacious. Uh, and it's just, I think it, it, that's what, not just career wise, but life in general, that, that I think creates this aura of satisfaction. Um, and, uh, and then also helps minimize any, any regrets. Uh, I think that's a definitely an important first step. Well, that's great. Well, certainly you've taken another, you know, uh, risk if you will, or, or, uh, 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 first step in, in launching Try Success Advisory. Yep. So uh, congratulations on, on the Thanks. launch of that, you know, as a, as a fellow entrepreneur, you know, it is, it does take, you know, uh, a leap of faith and, uh, you know, some courage uh, to do that. And I know you're doing some other things as well be, beyond that. So uh, I, I, again, Fab, uh, thank you very much for, for making the time to, to be with us today, share your story and your, your advice on, on this topic. And I'm sure that uh, we'll continue to cross paths and, uh, and I'm sure you'll continue to have a pulse on what's happening in the supply chain logistics realm. So again, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks again for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I want to thank those of you that joined us. Uh, if you're watching this episode on demand, uh, either at the Talking Logistics website or um, or on Fab's site, and uh, you've got a question for Fab, uh, you can put, either post it here or you can reach out to Fab via LinkedIn for sure. And uh, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. Again, thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.